You are listening to Beyond the Verse, a Star Citizen podcast. A show dedicated to Cloud Imperium Games, Star Citizen, and Squadron 42. Whether you fight, explore, unite, and or trade, we bring you news, updates, interviews, reviews, and analysis. So sit back, relax, grab yourself a pour of Radagast, and join us as we go Beyond the Verse. Launch sequence activated. Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Beyond the Verse Star Citizen podcast with your host, Solace. And we are embarking on episode 19 that we're calling Ship Showdown. Um, it's good to be back in the saddle. Uh, it's been two weeks since our last show. Um, as many of you already know, I took the family out on our family vacation, had a phenomenal time down in Mustang Island State Park, kind of the Corpus Christi, South Padre area area in Texas um, where it was freaking hot I mean you would think 110 degrees at least next to an ocean would be nice nope the sand is also 110 degrees so a lot of a lot of skipping around a lot of trying to find shade where we could but overall phenomenal trip Um, fast forward we'll touch maybe a little bit on that here in, in a little bit Fast forward to right now, yeah, it's like 110 degrees here in Austin, and my AC has decided to, um, it's it's still working, so I'm able to get the upstairs like how I want it, but the downstairs, it's like a clogged duct or a damper is malfunctioning, but I'm not getting any air downstairs, so if you see me sweating through my brand new merch... Beyond the Verse merchandise t-shirt. If you see me sweating through that, uh, it's not because I'm scared. It's not because I'm angry of uh, what we'll be discussing today from (laughs) the PTU uh, little surprise. Um, It has nothing to do with that. It's I'm dying in my house. Um, But at least I have a house to die in, uh, which brings me to a quick little community uh, outreach There is a fellow content creator. Many of you know this individual. Uh, They go by Enterprise, and unfortunately, they're going through a, a, a very large life struggle or a dynamic. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details. It's not my story to tell. Um, but essentially, um, they had to be evicted. Not for anything, not any malpractice or any issue from their end, Um, but the next door uh, establishment was collapsing and they would have to tear down the wall. And so basically his family, um, their family had had to be evicted and they're trying to figure it out. since since then, they have established a GoFundMe page, and I, I, I just quickly want to share the latest and greatest. So if you're watching on YouTube, I'm switching over to a shared screen. This is Enterprise. Um, his latest update uh, from maybe about an hour, hour and a half ago. Um, I wanted to share this latest update and then send over or at least communicate the GoFundMe uh, page. But anything helps, $20, whatever you're willing to you know give, uh, helps out a fellow Star Citizen. Uh, in a time of need. So just quickly, I'm going to share this uh, and then we'll we'll get started on with the rest of the show. What's up, everybody? I got a quick update for you. So in the past few hours since I made my post today and we started to go fund me, uh, we've already raised about $2,000, which is awesome. Really, really helpful because today we've already spent like over $1,000 easy on a moving truck and people. Uh, we got a storage space. Um, we're going to start that this weekend. Uh, we're going to look at a new place tomorrow. It might be bad, might be good. I don't know. I'm going to stream tonight. Look at this. Look at this. I've got the stream set up working. We got microphone. We got camera. We got a light. Uh, I'm going to stream something and hopefully it'll be fun. I am insanely stressed, but I want to say again, thank you everyone for looking at that GoFundMe. If you have not yet, there's still a lot more expenses to come uh, on this adventure. So thank you, and uh, hopefully I'll see you tonight on stream. So there you go. Um, A fellow star citizen in need. So I just wanted to share that. um, As a uh, community manager, if you will, um, well, as a human being, (laughs) 
<laughs> and, a, and a soldier in my entire history. I've always said mission first, people always. Um, so we all have our agendas. We all have our um, what we're striving for. But in, in, in the wake of everything, there's people. And I think we can't look past the people dynamic. So let's go help uh, this individual. Let's go help out their community. Um, I wish them the best on their stream tonight. The GoFundMe link is right here. I'm just gonna go ahead and click into it, but here we go. Um, man, it looks like they've already raised you know, 5.6K. So phenomenal, really happy for him. Uh, man, and I hope this finds you and your family well. We're gonna stick with business for just a couple more seconds, uh, and I might have exited out of the wrong, <laughs> might have exited out of the wrong screen. But um, I do want to touch on the uh, the current status of Beyond the Verse Star Citizen podcast. So what I do, I don't see this as a business. Um, I, I don't. I don't see this. I'm not trying to make this my occupation, um, but. I do think when you're cultivating a community, there's a little bit of transparency on just where we're going, where we've been and where we're going. Um, it helps build that community. It helps share kind of the vision and, and, and again, like where we're headed. So every month I drop a show review. It's essentially my or our value proposition when we're reaching out to developers, producers, other content creators, um, you as a number or as a member of our community um, affect those numbers, helps the community, it helps us tell the story. So here's July's monthly show review. Um, it's available on my Twitter, it's actually TikTok and Instagram, I made something for those, uh, for those platforms as well. But after 18 episodes, we're over 21 countries and over nine platforms on podcast alone. So that is phenomenal. And again, our main objective is and always will be podcasts. So those are, those are great numbers. Uh, but we also, two Sundays ago, we also hit a major milestone and crossed over a thousand listens. And I think as of like yesterday, we were at 1200. So, I mean, it's starting to pick up. It's starting to catch that fire. Um, so number one, thank you to everybody who listens to our podcast. It's only going to get better. We're going to have more fun individuals join uh, in the future. And I will also be on other individuals' podcasts as well. The next podcast being Trees. So many of you know in the community, Trees0311. Um, I will be on their podcast on Sunday, 2 p.m. Central. So again, very exciting uh, as we grow as a community. But it doesn't stop there. We're also doing these live shows or live broadcasts on YouTube and the replays. So we're at 174 subscribers on YouTube, almost 500 followers now on Twitter almost 400 followers over on TikTok. And then Instagram, I can't just figure out, like we're down at like 150. I also don't care so much about Instagram. Uh, it's like Facebook and I don't have a Facebook, so um, I'm not too interested in, in deep diving uh, the Instagram algorithm. But for all the other platforms and what we do, uh, this has been very humbling and very exciting. So again, I just wanted to share that uh, just as a general update towards where we're at and what we're doing. I see Citizen Groza in chat. Hey, Groza, how you doing, brother? Uh, thank you so much for joining again. I saw you in the last episode. See you today. It means a lot. It really does mean a lot. Welcome. So this week on Beyond the Verse, we will go over this week in Star Citizen. Uh, more importantly, we're going to go over the ship showdown. We started that a couple of days ago. What to expect in this first phase, what to expect in the next two phases, what it all means, some controversy around how some of the community is viewing it. So we'll touch on that. Uh, we'll go over the RSI launcher update, a very quick two second update, the Squadron 42 month report, the roadmap roundup, the PTU wave restructure that's a whole controversial thing to unpack uh, and then we are actually going to watch the inside star citizen uh, together live for the first time like I've never seen this um, so we're gonna watch it real time together that's gonna be fun and then we will end with a lore video that I created on Wednesday uh, to commemorate the Whitley's Guide Constellation Phoenix uh, so if you haven't gone over and checked that out yet um, 
it surprisingly took a long time to make. So I, I voiced over, voice overed, I voice overed um, the Galactopedia update for the Constellation Phoenix and then added some video and pulled in like the Constellation commercial and fly around uh, to make it more aesthetically appealing. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. And if you haven't seen yet, I hope you will enjoy it. But let's get into this week in Star Citizen. Uh, we already covered all of it already in the agenda, but I do like reading the paragraph. So let's share screen and let's get into this week in Star Citizen. So happy Monday, everyone. Today we're kicking off the ultimate in Vesselmania with this year's ship showdown. Who will become the ultimate champion of 2953 in the most important popularity event of the year? And I really wish they didn't call it the popularity event because therein lies some of the controversy, but we'll say why the Carrick will win a third time here in a couple minutes. <laughs> but first, it's time for our flyable and drivable crafts to survive phase one and get into the top 16. Otherwise, the dream of eternal glory will be crushed before it begins. To avoid early termination, your favorite needs your support, creativity, and cheering. Check out the Ship Showdown page for more details and your chance to win a spaceship. Phase 1, running until August 21st, is all about spotlighting your favorite vehicle by sharing original content to the Community Hub or Twitter with the hashtags hashtag SC Ship Showdown and hashtag Star Citizen. This can be an original song, something physically crafted, an epic in-game or real life shot, like a YouTube video of the Constellation Phoenix, <laughs> a trailer, a music video. You can even take it a step further and construct the ship in real life if you're up to the challenge to maximize your favorites chances of advancing to phase two and the top 16 a vote, like and reshare any content of the vessel you want to win. Now let's get on to what's going on for this week. Tuesday marks the return of the narrative team with Jerry, a half told history. Hmm. I never saw that drop. Anyways, this Wednesday <laughs> sees the latest roadmap update. You know, hold on. We're doing this live. I'm, I'm okay doing this live. Comlink, uh, Inside Star Citizen, Squadron 42. Here's your Whitley's guide. I don't see Jerry, a half told. Yeah, it might be a typo, or they just chose to go a whole different direction. Interesting. Jerry, a half-told history, did not drop on Tuesday. This Wednesday sees the latest roadmap update accompanied by a roadmap roundup. Plus, we'll publish last week's July Squadron 42 monthly report email as a com link. On Thursday, Inside Star Citizen's latest episode uh, is a look at the VFX, the visual uh, FX department, their role in development, and an update on their latest work. Looking forward to watching that live with you. This Friday, so tomorrow, this Friday, Star Citizen Live returns with Elliot Maltby from Mission Features, which is one of my favorite topics and roadmap updates, who will take us through the mission making process. That's going to be exciting. That's going to be a really good hour, hour and a half, truly. Uh, and then last, don't forget, you have until Friday at 7 a.m., 7 a.m. UTC to participate in the 2953 Arlington Gang Screenshot Contest to win a beefy battleship. Uh, just a reminder, that's the mission spotlight that we've been talking about in the last couple episodes, so make sure you uh, participate in that. So have a stellar week in both in and out of the verse. Uh, and that is it for this week in Star Citizen. Okay. So here we go. Ship Showdown. Um, all right. So let me preface... Let me preface the ship showdown from my perspective, and then the next couple of minutes will hopefully be a little bit more, uh, it'll make a little bit more sense. So I started playing Star Citizen in 2952, so just last year. All of this I've seen before, so we're now, I'm, I'm now past the one year mark, so I'm starting to see the second iteration of everything. I don't have the beefy background that some of these content creators or community members uh, on Twitter, I don't have their perspective necessarily. So when I saw Ship Showdown, I remember last year having a really good time creating like a March Madness bracket. Um, I, I went full Amazon on on this, like a Excel spreadsheet with a power pivot. It automatically, 
you know, color coded and arranged the way performers were. And like, I was able to have a, a really deep analysis towards the very end to say, you know, how, how it all shook out. Right. So I remember doing all that. I remember it being fun. Um, however, there were some individuals on Twitter that kind of shined, shone a light on a different perspective. Um, and let me just, let me just share that um, that alternate point of view. I'm not going to like belabor it, but just a way of looking at um, a problem from both angles. So here we go. A marketing event is defined by the acronym WAR, W-A-R. So win back your acquisition and retention. So everything that you do in marketing is really pinpointing one or more of those three acronyms. So this is a marketing event. There's no doubt about it. So ship showdown marketing event. Are they really trying to win back anybody? Like if you left to play Diablo four or you haven't touched the game in several years, I don't think ship showdown is really going to bring people back to the game. Um, it's cool, right? Like it's a cool concept and we'll get into that here in a couple seconds, but it's not win back. Um, it's not really acquisition. You're not really acquiring new gamers. Uh, if I'm brand new and I've just now heard about Star Citizen because I follow Beyond the Verse Star Citizen podcast on socials, um, it's not like this event is going to be like, hey, you know, I know all 150 plus ships in the game. I'm going to get behind something and vote for it and create content and etc. Right. So at the end of the day, this event is very retention. It's very like the people who are currently engaged in the game, in the event, um, it's to get them more involved. And then through that, there's like secondary and tertiary orders of effect where that is free marketing and it is recruiting people into the game because you are seeing more of the ships in a very creative way. So it's definitely retention. So when, you know, you look at a retention event, it is very easy. And here's where the controversy comes in. It's very easy for that event to start to be perceived as a popularity contest, right? Like the ships, yes, it's a popularity of the ship, but it's also, uh, it's also like a flex for the content creators and the size of their community, and that really is all that matters in this conversation, sadly. So let me give you just one example. If I am a brand new content creator with five followers, right? And I say, you know what? The Anvil Hawk is absolutely the best ship in the game. Hey, come on, community of five. Let's go and let's upvote. I'm going to submit my cool creation on all the different platforms with the hashtags. I'm going to say it's the Anvil Hawk, but I might get five upvotes and then maybe two or three more down the road, right? But if I have somebody or if I have a community of like 10,000 and I say, <laughs> this is funny, Buster, don't hate me. Uh, but if I say like the Drake Dragonfly is the best but I get my entire community to come and vote for the Drake Dragonfly. You see where I'm going with this? That is going to win the upvote. That's gonna win what we see or who we see in this race of 16. So that is kind of the controversy. I would not be doing my due diligence as a content creator who has always promised to give fair and balanced like analysis if I did not provide the alternate point of view. Now, I don't subscribe to that. I want to go on record. I'm going to look at the screen, like making eye contact with you. I don't subscribe to that. I don't, first off, like I don't necessarily care about popularity contests. It's not a thing for me. Um, but I also don't think it's really that um, game breaking or community breaking. It's just a dynamic that people are talking about on social media. Enough. Let's get into what Ship Showdown is uh, for the rest of this conversation. So, sharing screen, you should now see the Ship Showdown. Um, all these links will be available in the uh, in the show notes. So, here we go. The first phase is community call. It's August seventh. It's about three days ago to August twenty first, and it's exactly what we just read in this week in Star Citizen. So, if you have a favorite ship get creative 
create a video, create a song, build it out of Legos, whatever the heck that you want to do, uh, this is your time to do it. You submit it through the community hub. Uh, you actually choose, well, you submit the media and then you choose which ship it goes under and then those go into a categorical like evaluation. So if the Constellation Phoenix gets a crap load of upvotes, not just mine, but other Constellation Phoenix's uh, submissions, that's what's going to end up going to the the 16, right? You can also tweet it, hashtag uh, SE Ship Showdown. But this is the community call. So nominate your favorite vehicle, voice your support for your favorite flyable, drivable ship, or vehicle by submitting an original creation to the community hub. Um, I'm not going to reread this because this is actually exactly what we have just read. And this lasts from now uh, at the time of recording this podcast. It remains for 10 days, 18 hours, 37 minutes, and now 51 seconds. The next phase is the live showdown. Now, this is what I remember from last year. The live showdown takes place from August 23rd to September 6th, and that's where every day, um, if I remember correctly, it's like every day at 11 a.m. Central, they'll put the match up. It'll be like Scorpius versus, you know, Pisces. Um, And then you go in and you vote which one's better than the other. And it's March Madness, right? It's like the March Madness basketball bracket where whoever wins moves on to the next round and they play each other, right? And then last but not least, the winner crowned on September 7th. Now, usually, uh, and I think they've committed to this already, usually it's uh, like a paint scheme. Last year, the there was four of them, Carrick, uh, MSR, the Pisces, and the Scorpius. Somebody correct me if I'm not right there, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. Uh, the paint scheme was amazing. It was this like, it's not black, almost like a charcoal in like a metallic red, a gorgeous, gorgeous paint scheme, paint scheme. So I can't wait to see what this year is going to be. But that's why like this matters. Like you want that awesome paint scheme on your favorite ship. So get in there, get uh, involved, and let's just go quickly through some of these awesome, awesome examples. So we got cartoons, we have Photoshopping, evidently. <laughs> um, you got in-game photos, you got models being created, you've got Legos, here in a second you'll see Legos. Um, I saw a music drop, oil painting, which that's a Photoshop. Um, I know exactly what that is. That's a Photoshop opportunity. Um, but again, some like really awesome pieces. A lot of, here's Legos. Um, this is funny. So this one right here by Cron- Cronk Writer. I actually follow each other on, on uh, socials. So this, his picture that you're seeing on the screen almost looks like a D&D um, like player sheet or character sheet. I almost thought about doing something like that or taking, because Baldur's Gate 3 is like a thing right now, taking a character sheet and making a ship based off of like a character sheet. I don't know. Would be kind of neat or kind of cool. But anyways, that is it for the ship showdown. It, it I, I think it's one of the more fun things that the community does. Um, all the... All, all the shit talking, like all of all of the rivalry that you know comes from this. Um, what I will say though, and I'm gonna end, I'm gonna end on this note. I made the joke earlier about the Carrick winning a third time in the row, not in a row, but total. So this has been going on for about four years, um, and I don't remember like the four winners. I know the the MPUV cargo one one year the Carrick two and if i'm not mistaken the very first year was the cutlass black i'm pretty sure so cutlass black Carrick, and then the mpuv cargo and then the Carrick again last year the question becomes like like how is it not the Carrick? Yeah, it's like a $700 ship, like it's, or whatever the, the price is. It's a very, very, very expensive ship. Um, it's very expensive in game if you're gonna buy it with UEC. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's hands down the best ship in the game. Like, you can't tell me it's not. If you have a, if you have a team of like three or four 
there's really in my mind there's no more at this current moment there's not a more fun ship to fly maybe the 890 jump because it has you know a a medical bay and it's got obviously beds that you can log in and out on but the medical bay and respawn point is huge but the 890 jump you're spending almost a thousand dollars on that ship whereas the carrick you've got a great tiered medical bay you have the spawn point and of course you know the beds or whatever um it's just a really good loop with a Pisces hangar and a ground vehicle garage. It's hard to beat the Carrick. I don't know how it doesn't win again, <laughs> but I've been I've been wrong before. All right, so we've spent a lot of time talking about the ship showdown. It's the namesake of today's episode, so I wanted to make sure that we dove into that uh, deeply. But it brings up our next segment, and it's super fast, a very, very, very quick segment. Um, and it is the RSI launcher update. I will always, always on all of my podcasts give you all the news, all the news that's officially CIG. So the comm link and the uh, Spectrum announcements. So this just so happened to have dropped on August 8th, so about two days ago. So we're covering it. So tough <laughs> it'll be a couple of seconds in the next segment we'll start but here we go rsi launcher 1.6.8 release notes uh, so make sure if you haven't played the game in a while uh, don't be alarmed when you have to update your launcher when you log back in to the article today we're releasing rsi launcher version 1.6.8 the main features for the launcher uh, are a new data patcher and some additional error handling on api calls to the platform it fixed stalling in between phases on game download and it fixed error handling on 429 503 and all 500 errors on the platform it changed the log.log file which is now stored in the logs folder under and then it gives you the address and then the article ends if you find any bugs on rsi launcher 1.6.8 please include your log.log file in your issue council report using the rsi launcher 1.6.8 category and then again, it repeats the log point log file can be found at this location. So that's the end of it. That's literally the RSI launcher update. Um, but I do think it's a, I do think it's important. Um, first off, if you are thinking about getting into the actual alpha beta mindset of reporting, like discovering issues and reporting issues, the Issues Council is actually a phenomenal platform of, of giving feedback and hearing other people's feedback, upvoting and what we call plus one, like plus oneing uh, at work. But it's it's a really good platform it's a really good program um, and what this is saying is like there's a log.log file and i think that's probably the best takeaway from here it's like it changed the address of what you're used to using or finding to upload so now you know boom doing my job as as your <laughs> number one stop for news reviews updates and analysis roadmap update let's go so the roadmap update, this was August 7th at 1 p.m. Let's get into the screen share. Uh, not a lot new. This was kind of looked past really quickly in the community. The Squadron 42 monthly report was also kind of blown through very quickly. There was not a lot of takeaways from both articles. And again, there's 52 weeks out of the year. I don't think there's going to be this groundbreaking, earth-shattering news every single week that we have this roadmap roundup and i know it's like every other week but you know what i mean my point remains so here we go the roadmap update notable changes for august 9th so this actually was yesterday i don't know where the 7th it's interesting roadmap roundup says 8 7 august 7th but this actually dropped on august 9th and that was a windows update that just hit fantastic <laughs> doing things live release view the following deliverable has passed its final review, therefore we are toggling its status to committed for Alpha 320. So latest and greatest addition to 320, it's being committed. The physicalized cargo updates. 
as it should. <laughs> We're expecting the whole sea, right? So if the whole sea is coming, you should expect the physicalized cargo updates to also come. So physicalized cargo updates, adding new functionality to accommodate the release of the Miss Coal Sea. This includes both automated cargo loading at Leo stations, as well as SCU containers up to 32 SCU. And then we had some updates to the progress tracker, just quickly. Um, this, if I remember correctly, it's a merging of teams or it's a reallocation of teams. Not a big deal. doesn't really impact us as, as a consumer, um, but it is interesting if you're following the development. It's a reallocation of efforts and teams. So here we go. With this update, we wanted to make you aware of a few upcoming team changes on Star Citizen to better support upcoming tasks and to accommodate the additional development resources coming in from our Montreal studio. The USPU gameplay feature in systemic services and tools teams, God, that's a mouthful, are being reformed into a pair of new teams. These teams will be the NAPU gameplay feature team and the economy team. The majority of USPU and SST's tasks will be given to these new teams, along with a few going to other teams. We'll have more info on these teams, their deliverables, and their schedules in the future. But for now, we're updating USPU and SST schedules to end in Q3. Additionally, we're also introducing the Vehicle Gameplay Feature Team. This team will have a focus on the Persistent Universe and its vehicles, with our existing Vehicle Feature Team remaining on Squadron 42. All three of these new teams will have their schedules updated on Progress Tracker very soon, but we wanted to give you an early heads up. And that's all for this week. Join the discussion on Spectrum and check out the Roadmap Companion Guide for more information on the Star citizen public roadmap so like i said nothing really earth shattering as far as we are concerned like we already expected with the whole seat coming we already expected the physicalized cargo to be a thing so it's great that they're committed to it now it makes me have the warm and fuzzies uh, as we get into 320 and not having a half-assed uh, product being developed for us or produced for that patch so awesome the team's breaking up. I've said it in a couple of uh, episodes ago, but if you're familiar with um, gaming, if you're familiar with the gaming industry, the production development side of things, this is nothing new. It's nothing. Uh, it's nothing bad or good. It's just when you get close to the end of some of these life cycles, um, it's just a better way to put the umbrella in its appropriate place, right? It doesn't make sense for there to be. Um, loose ends or people just kind of twiddling their thumbs you reallocate headcount you reallocate their uh, glide paths to success right this hair is like falling that's weird awesome so there you go let's fast forward into what i what i think is probably the more controversial piece to tonight's episode so we're halfway through what you can look forward to in the rest half, this the second half of the show. We're going to cover this controversy, but then we're going to watch the Inside Star Citizen at real time for the first time for me, real time uh, together. And then we're going to end with my Constellation Phoenix video um, that we created on Wednesday. So stay tuned. Uh, OK, so today this was, I don't know, four hours ago three hours ago there was an announcement for the ptu wave restructure so i i'm, I'm trying to figure out like how i want to talk about this um because at, at the end of the day it's really not uh it's really not that big of a deal so i don't want to build it up to be anything that it's not um i have an opinion about the end state and it's like both good and bad so here we go let me just read the article and then i'll respond to it hello everyone as you all may know one of the most impactful development resources we have is the direct feedback coming from all of you this includes the player behavior data we receive from the latest builds in the PTU. Whether it's pushing the servers to their limits under heavy load and luring bugs out of hiding, to putting a new feature through its paces in focused test cases, you're an essential part of the process. The PTU is a replica environment of all the necessary components that make our universe work. 
It is in this environment where both community members and Cloud Imperium staff alike test as we hone in on release candidate, on a release candidate, RC. Access to the PTU has historically been granted in waves to control the number of players in the environment based on testing needs. More often than not, a new feature or build will benefit from a gradual increase in concurrency rather than a floodgate or a floodgate of traffic. This allows us to monitor at varying degrees of scale to ensure that once content makes it onto the live servers, it will be performant. For the last four years, we haven't changed the PTU wave system, which regulates who has access to the test servers and when. Over time, more and more players have gained access to various waves, which has ultimately led us away from our initial goals with testing waves. We have also come to notice that many players only log in once per PTU phase to briefly inspect the latest features or new ships before waiting for the live release break. That is 100% me. <laughs> I just I want to be very transparent with the listeners. That is me, and I'll explain more in a second. Back to the article. This led to very high player loads in the first hours of each wave release, combined with comparatively high server costs and download provisioning, but not the sustained play testing we would have preferred. As a consequence, towards the end of a PTU phase, we sometimes lack the necessary numbers of testers to put the servers under pressure once the most significant bugs had been fixed. For this reason, the team has decided to restructure the PTU waves to focus on player activity. Now, the more often you play and the more experienced and familiar you are with the game and its mechanics, the earlier we'll invite you to enter the PTU. To support this and the players that would like to access the PTU, we'll review the activity-based wave allocation several times a year to ensure we have the most active testers within the first waves. So, if you have been following development more from the sidelines recently, don't worry. Hop back into the pilot seat as future activity will lead to earlier PTU access in a relatively short time. Naturally, we also want to continue to open the door for everyone who has supported us. For this reason, we'll continue to accommodate subscriber and the various concierge levels throughout the new wave program. We're looking forward to this new approach as together we'll gain even more data from the PTU phases and, as a result, a better experience on the live servers in the long run. Below you'll find the new restructured waves for the PTU. So you've got the uh, Avocity, the Avocity Test Flight Group. It's the hand-selected players under a non-disclosure agreement, NDA. Very experienced volunteer testers chosen based on the long-term provision of constructive feedback, quality and quantity of bug reports, and overall activity. Wave 1, top active players rated by hours in the previous two major patch cycles, plus subscribers, plus the Legatus Navium concierge level backers. So that's your Wave 1. Wave 2 is your next top active players rated by hours in the previous two major patch cycles and the Praetorian Concierge level backers. So what you're seeing here, just to recap, what you're seeing here is a player engagement and a monetary engagement, entry fee, whatever. <laughs> Wave 3 is the next top active players rated by hours in the previous two major patch cycles and then Wing Commander, Space Marshal, and Grand Admiral Concierge level backers. Wave 4, next top active players rated by hours in the previous two major pa patch cycles, plus the High Admiral Concierge level backers, and then your Wave 5, all backers with an active game package. End of article. Okay, so my response to this, um, I agree whole heartedly for this to be player engaged um the number one priority being the player engagement like that that makes total sense to me it does not make sense and i have friends that fit this category for somebody who hasn't played the game in two or three years to hear about p 
Pyro 4.0 dropping in the next couple of weeks. And so they automatically get into this, uh, you know, this opportunity to play 4.0 before everybody else. So I like the engagement piece. It's the real time engaged players that are quote unquote earning their way to see content earlier and faster, right? So I 100% back the, the active player piece. Here is where, uh, here is where like, I, I, I have a problem with like the rest of it or maybe like another way of viewing what I literally just said. So the paying to be a part of something. So real quick, wave one, wave one is subscribers plus the Legatus Navium concierge level backers. So you're telling me that somebody who spends $10 I find out that Pyro is dropping September 1st, as an example. I paid 10 bucks to become a subscriber. Now I have the same access that a top active player and somebody who has spent twenty twenty five thousand dollars on the game as a Legatus Navium concierge member, just because I spent $10. Like that to me blows my mind. I don't see how that translates. I don't. Um, that's where I kind of draw the line is, and it was the same, it was the same thing in my mind, not to be petty and not to bring up, you know, this whole thing, but citizen con VIP tickets, it's the same thing. Um, kind of in reverse though, that subscribers were able to have the same VIP, like wave one of uh, chances as a Legata Snavium, you know, concierge level member. So I feel like I feel like there needs to be some ironing out on subscriber versus concierge. I do agree that those two should be uh, before all other backers with an active game package, right? Because I do think if you put in the money, there should be some perks to some ROI or some you know yield from you spending that kind of money. But I don't know if it's currently being balanced appropriately. I don't know a subscriber as being part of wave one makes sense <clears throat> against somebody who has already spent, you know, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars in the game. So that's the that's what's being discussed right now. And then literally this dropped a couple hours ago. So it's currently live on Twitter if you, you know, wanted to be part of the conversation or see what everybody's talking about. Um, but here's the deal: like in my ultimate response to this. I don't care uh, at all because I also don't believe in playing the PTU. No, this is this is just me. This is solace. This is solace. This is not beyond the verse Star Citizen podcast. This is not what I think other people should do. But for me as a gamer, I don't believe in an alpha for an alpha. This game is already in alpha. I don't need a pre 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 alpha. Um, it, 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 it blows my mind. Now I understand why you would need kind of a smaller test segment. Like I understand the why I think fundamentally, I already know this game's an alpha and they're too afraid to, and I say afraid, I, I don't mean that in a, in a negative way. They're not ready to commit to a beta transition, right? I know they're not there yet, um, but it just, it feels, it feels weird. It feels like almost we should be in beta with this concept, I feel like we should be in beta with a PTU or hell, we should even be live with a PTU. And there's a whole nother can of worms, a whole nother debate we can have on whether or not we should be live now and anticipating updates, right? Because we're basically live anyways. That's not this podcast. That's a whole nother conversation, a whole nother time um, on where this game should be versus the promises that have been made in the last 10 to 12 years. I'm going to let that dust settle. <laughs> I will read those comments uh, in YouTube and on my podcast notes, I'm sure. Um, let's get into the Inside Star Citizen Life of VFX. Um, I'm going to read the article real quick. Well, paragraph. I'm going to read the paragraph real quick. And then let's watch it together. Again, I this is the first time we're doing this, and I have not watched it beforehand. So I don't know what to expect. This is going to be fun. But the article on the webpage, that's screen share. Can you imagine a world 
without visual effects? Well, no, of course not. Today, we're going behind the scenes with a VFX team to reveal how their work breathes life into every game element they touch. From obvious explosions to many subtle environmental effects you may not have noticed before. Let's get into it. Looking forward to it. Let's go. Hi, welcome to CIG Cribs. I'm Mike Snowden, and this is where the magic happens. So VFX in video games, certainly in our games in particular, it, it's, it's basically, it, it's energy represented visually. So your more typical VFX, explosions, fire, all that kind of thing, they're representing that kind of energy and the motion and the force and the violence that, that comes through. And even things like leaves getting blown around by the wind, it's motion uh, in, in games. VFX are everywhere in Star Citizen. So there's coolant, there's steam, there's mist, there's fog. There's falling leaves, there's buzzing flies. If the player fires a weapon, they're going to expect some kind of payload for that. They're going to expect to see muzzle flashes, depending on the weapon, of course, but they're going to expect to see impact effects. Again, without them kind of the effects in a game, it's hard for the player to really read what's, what's happening. It, it, they're not kind of getting them visual cues and it sort of hinders their progress. I think the effects matter in Star Citizen because the visual... I want to go back to that picture real quick. Hold on. Hold on. ...cues and it sort of hinders their progress. Where is that at? So first off, it's it's gorgeous. If you're listening on podcast, they've I've paused it. Now it's a work in progress, Roger. But I've paused it. It almost looks like maybe like Ida or um, maybe one of the moons in R Corp, maybe. But the cloud or the uh, what do you call like the Milky Way? Um, cloud like the nebula i guess or whatever the the cloud looking solar system whatever it's it's gorgeous this is beautiful i kind of want to use this as like a wallpaper i digress but that's such a gorgeous image i think vfx matter in star citizen because the visuals are, are fantastic in our game but without the actual VFX, the, everything can look very static. So there's not always the most tangible thing in a, in a frame that the player sees, but when you take away VFX, you kind of notice that they're not there. I joined CIG nine years ago, and there was quite a small group of us, actually. There was there was three or four of us VFX artists. So originally, the, the VFX uh, were struggling for consistency. It was obvious that it was a project in its very early days and we were looking for that identity. We were looking for that kind of consistency of visuals, that, that language that can be understood by the player. And that's really why you build a team, why you build a department to allow that kind of continuity in, in VFX in a game. So really in the nine years that I've been here, we've kind of built a department, a proper department, full of different skill sets, different disciplines. We've got a whole programming team, we've got production, we've got embedded QA, we've got concepts. We've obviously got artists as well. We now have a coherence of, of visuals. We have a language that is understandable and works for the player. We had a good base in the first place, but now the, the, the toolkit is really, really powerful and it needs to be for the ambition of the VFX in the game. So the VFX team is basically a microcosm of game development. The team is currently 21 people. We also have a core team within that, being the programmers, the production side of it, the concept inside of it, and the QA side of it as well. And we need that because we're serving other departments. We're serving art, we're also serving design. And we need to have that kind of skill set within the team to be able to... So that piece is really huge. Um, a lot of times I hear opinions or assumptions that these teams are very like singular um, but we've talked about it on this podcast many times now where it's not like their nine to five is executing on one thing there's many teams that depend on other teams there's many efforts that depend on other efforts and so when he says those that comment about you know impacting these other departments that can unravel 
your timeline dramatically, right? If a team, I say fails, if a team is delayed for whatever reason on their product, you could be sitting around twiddling your thumbs, waiting on that asset to be produced. Uh, so that, that's a very, very key takeaway um, in what was just said. Be able to do all the things that are requested of us. I'm Leo van Steenkisser. I'm a principal VFX programmer. I do two things. I manage a small team, three, four people of VFX programmers, and I kind of handle the different projects that we have as a team that, that gets done. And then the second part is I do pr some programming myself as well. So I in intentionally kept the team pretty small so that I have some time to program myself as well. My name is Francesco. Uh, I am a VFX programmer. We had a team of four VFX programmers and the one that manages me is Leo. I program specific graphics features and tools and other stuff related to VFX, specifically mainly for artists to be able to do work with and create really nice visuals from. My name is Alexander. I'm on the VFX team as a tools programmer. My job is to create sliders and UA elements to make it intuitive for the artists to work with. We have a lot of different environments and effects and we need to take care of every single one of them. And it's my job to make sure that it's easy for an artist to work with different type of effects. I'm Colm and my job in the VFX team is assistant producer. So generally, day to day, I do scheduling and just supporting the team in anything that they need to do. So they get to focus on the creative things whilst I deal with what they would class as the, the boring side of game development. So I, I've said it before, I'll say it again, probably insult half the people listening, uh, a, a producer, is another word for program manager or project manager. It, there's a lot of overlap. <laughs> I know someone's gonna hate me for saying that, but if for those of you who are not familiar with the gaming industry, that's probably the best, it's probably the best correlation or the best kind of relatable uh, thing about a producer. If the VFX team didn't have a producer, it, it would be horrible. He manages a lot and talk to other teams and make sure we have all the information we need to be able to start working on a task. If we had to do that ourselves, that would be a lot of hours wasted every day. The VFX editor is basically the place where you create the effects. You give it a texture or a picture and you change a few values and suddenly it moves and you see coming to life. It could be a smoke, it could be a fire, it could be lightning. There is not much you can do without the code. That would make the artist a programmer. We program everything related to VFX. That includes tools, that includes features, that includes smaller things like triggering VFX from game codes to system for managing VFX, making sure that VFX stay alive, that they die on time. As VFX programmer, we get to work closely with VFX artists. My name is Kevin and I am a VFX artist here at CIG. 90% of the effects we make in Star Citizen are particle effects. When you fire a weapon, at the end of the barrel, we will spawn a particle with a texture on it, and then we modify parameters to be able to make that look like a muscle flash or smoke or whatever. So basically, we just have a bunch of parameters on how to spawn, how to move, and what a particle looks like. Star Citizen is a really beautiful game, and VFX are a large part. Effects really need to be tailored for basically every possible situation. This gives a lot of opportunities for creating visuals and effects in ways that you would normally not see in other games. The VFX needs to be seen from every angle, from a very far distance to very close up. We have such varying scales from just small rooms to planets to ships and even just empty space itself. Everything needs to be dynamic and systemic. So all the VFX, they are based on the underlying systems. We get to look at these systems, find the right hooks, and try and trigger the right effects at the right time. Getting all of that together to get a consistent whole is pretty challenging, but the results are always pretty cool. The relationship within the team is very dynamic. We work together a lot and it kind of depends on what you're working on to who's involved. Production tends to be involved a lot of the time, generally on a day-to-day -day basis.
Working closely with artists and obviously other programmers is pretty great. There is a lot of feedback and information circling around what parts of what you're working on you may want to improve on or even what parts are working well and should be iterated on even further. It creates an environment in which no one feels like they're stuck on something. So the VFX team, we're basically a support team for everyone else. We create effects for the vehicle team. We create effects for the locations teams, including planets. Any location you can think of, we're going to be adding effects to them in some form or other. And gameplay as well. Obviously, all of these things are, are design driven. So we need to create effects that help designers provide that feedback to the player. We won't always be working on the effects at the exact same time. We don't really come in on towards the end because we don't want to work on something that's going to get changed eventually. So once a ship has been approved, that's when the VFX team starts to work on it. Mostly people don't notice VFX. I think subconsciously they do. They look at a ship and they see a cool thruster or when it dies, a cool explosion or whatever. So, so that has to be one of the most uh, commonplace pieces of feedback I have I have heard uh, from Amazon Game Studios and from the other interviews that I've done. Yeah, it's a very undervalued, uh, underappreciated. It's a very underappreciated art to create a game because gamers can, and I speak as one, obviously. But we, we get into a game, we immerse ourselves, and hey, this is beautiful, the graphics are gorgeous. Okay, let's move on. What's the story? Or what's the lore? Or hey, that's a really cool mission loop. But we go through this as a consumer and we just, you know, we just eat and vomit, right? <laughs> like the game, and you know, some of us create content for it, and like we'll make our own little versions of diving and immersion. Um, but so much goes unnoticed or underappreciated and and it's not because like we're bad people <laughs> it's it's you know you're not and you just heard that individual say it you're not paying attention or or you have to be looking at the way uh, your vtol system is working on your constellation phoenix or the way the vtol system is working on your cutlass black like you see the whole thing move great awesome but did you notice the 100 pieces that are maneuvering and moving and lighting up and smoke and fire and like probably not you get this blast of like visual you know uh, I was going to say something not appropriate for the podcast but like visual pleasure of uh, of of you know your ship but then you move on to the next thing so that's if there's nothing else that you get from this and this team and what they're talking about um, give them their time you know, allow them to have this 15 minutes of sharing what they do and what they're passionate about because they deserve it. They've earned it. And it goes, it goes underappreciated. But then again, we have the subtle effects. You don't notice it. And the less you notice it, the better it is. It just plays in with the whole environment. We provide a supporting role uh, and we, we contribute to making the game as good as we can. So the future of VFX at CIG is bigger and better, as cheesy as that might sound, but it's also it's maintaining existing effects and it's building tools within the team that make that possible. So one example of kind of tool improvements to, to help us maintain uh, as well as improve effects is external referencing. Let's say you have two water effects. They look very alike, but there is a slight difference. And suddenly an artist makes an even better picture to use for these water effects. My job then was to implement a feature to just be able to change the picture of one effect and both of them change at the same time. And what that's going to do is allow us to have a small group of master effects that we can then propagate to other effects libraries throughout the game. And it means we can, we can maintain a smaller group of effects and we can make sure that those improvements cascade throughout all the other libraries where those type of effects will be used. Being able to have the same effect looking a bit different over two projects saves time for the artists and it's easier for them to keep track of everything and upgrade the visual 
of an effect. So that's going to streamline the process, absolutely. It's going to make it easier to keep a high quality, to keep updating and improving the high quality through the years as well. So currently I'm working on lightning within gas clouds. We already have some lightning system uh, in place, but now we're adapting it to be possible to strike from within gas clouds. This will give some extra gameplay opportunities for designers and environment artists to dynamically spawn the lightning and uh, hit ships, hit players, uh, and make gas clouds more dangerous, I guess. I think the lightning are cool, is cool, but I really like the new fire. <laughs> So something that we're really proud of and that we've been working on for a long time is fire propagation, so fire hazards, and that's being handled by our VFX programmers. The fire hazard system has already existed for a while, but it was never fully finalized on the visual side. So I'm currently implementing all the necessary backend features to get fire looking as good as possible. As part of the fire visuals, I am working on a more specialized way of spawning particles for fire, which creates a more interesting dynamic way in which fire propagates and the way things start to look charred as but after fire has been there for a while. That's been kind of a long process and it's still ongoing. It's very, very complicated and it's very ambitious, but we're getting to a point now where I'm really, really happy with where it's going. The fire hazard system itself is obviously gameplay critical. The visuals obviously help to communicate where fire is present, how strongly it's there, and to give a real sense of danger for the room you're in. The actual damage that the fire is causing on rooms is communicated through these visuals. So this is one of those opportunities. Uh, if you're listening on podcast, you've got to go check this out. The fire moving through the rooms is very impressive. Uh, let me just X out of this little window. Um, seeing that come across the ship. So first off, this is a whole aspect of flying and playing Star Citizen I haven't actually considered. But not only are you, like as an engineer, not only are you keeping up your equipment and making sure that things are working appropriately, I imagine there's also putting out fires that happen on your ship. Um, and how frightening in the middle of space <laughs> Nowhere, nowhere else to go. How frightening would it be uh, to have a room look like this, covered in complete flames, bottom and top? Um, this is this is very impressive. Uh, watching the fire go through rooms, very, very awesome to watch. One of the best things about working on VFX for Star Citizen is being able to see your work enter the game so quickly because we update the game so re so often. So being able to see your work in players' hands is always exciting. To release a feature, some new VFX that are part of one of the releases and you see players actually use your system and kind of push it to the limit. And it's, it's always great to see. Working on Star Citizen in particular is especially good because Star Citizen is a really really good looking game. Working generally in graphics and VFX, I think personally is one of the more satisfying sort of disciplines when it comes to programming. VFX is one of the big puzzle pieces to making the environment feel rich and full. I feel like that's one of the biggest gains of VFX, is making the game look beautiful. So, what did we learn this week? Well, hopefully we learned a bit more about how downstream teams like VFX, these folks who generally come in towards the end of the pipeline, bring life, texture, and nuance to any game, add those finishing touches that elevate the amazing work of other teams, and add essential elements that really, really make the difference between the immersive and the uh, not immersive. Now don't forget that this year's ship showdown has begun, as well as a new initiative spotlighting the various missions in the verse. I'm pretty sure this week it's salvage. You can check it all out now on the robertspaceindustries.com website. For Inside Star Citizen, I'm Jared Huckabee. Thanks for letting us share the process of game development with you, and we'll see you all here next week. All right, so the little, like, I don't know if it's, additional time but jared just left the screen uh and the screen's like a word document that says all work and no D, &D makes jared something something <laughs> uh D, D boulders gate 3 is an amazing game this is not a podcast for bg3 but um 
Good Lord, is that an amazing game? If you haven't picked it up, you're doing yourself a disservice. Uh, let's see if there's anything in the next 30 seconds. Let's go. Yeah, you never know anymore. Uh, yeah, so that was great. And again, I, I don't want to just rehash everything that we said in the last 15 minutes or so. Um, but it, it downstream teams like VFX, you've got to highlight them. You have to celebrate them. You have to you have to understand, like especially in the gaming industry, you have to understand that a lot of that work is underappreciated uh, from the consumer. Right, um, I would have never paid much attention to the rifle and like the dunnage coming out of um, of the barrel, right? So like the particles and the lighting of the particles. I just see a weapon system. I fire it and I hope it kills my enemy, right? Like that's that's it. Like it looks great. I, it better look good because I'm firing a weapon in 2023, um, like in real life, <laughs> right? So it should look like it. Um, but that expectation is my point. Right. This is kind of under appreciation of what those teams have to go through. So uh, awesome video. Thank you so much, Star Citizen. Thank you, Inside Star Citizen, for sharing that. Um, let's get into this week's lore deep dive. Let's go. I, for one, am very proud. That's not like a seek for affirmation or validation. I am very proud of the video that we created on Wednesday. Um, I ended up tagging like the hashtag SC ship showdown, you know, for, for consideration. But I just have a um, an affinity for the constellation Phoenix. So much so that I ended up getting the Emerald through that lucky package uh, in March the fortune for teller uh, package, but I, I, I wanted the Emerald. And so when I saw that the Whitley's guide or the Galactopedia update was the constellation Phoenix, I thought what better way to submit content for this contest than to do a voiceover of the lore. So I had fun doing it. Um, it was like about three to four hours worth of work that I, I don't, uh, like I need to streamline and figure out how to do it faster because it, it was so much fun, but that's a lot of time to do like in between meetings and before and after work and a seven year old son and his four year old daughter, like, right. So, so I just got to figure that piece out, but I hope you enjoy. Uh, if you haven't already seen this, this is the constellation Phoenix the Galactopedia lore voice over by yours truly. Again, I hope you enjoy this. Let's go to the video and I will not be responding to this. I'm just going to show it and then we'll end the podcast. So thanks in advance. Love you guys. Here we go. The Constellation Phoenix. Development history. The Phoenix is a variant of the standard Constellation platform developed as Robert Space Industries' first luxury market spacecraft. When the development of the Phoenix variant was first announced in 2935, it seemed to be an unusual direction for Robert Space Industries, a company that had made its name offering affordable spacecraft, quote, to the people, end quote. The Phoenix's origin story is appropriately unusual. The variant project began following the brief success of a Spectrum series called Spacecraft of the Elite. The series premiered in 2932 and showed off top-tier luxury spacecraft owned by the rich and the powerful, which spawned a custom interior design trend for spacecraft. This led to the creation of numerous luxury brands dedicated to enhancing more common spacecraft designs. It also landed at exactly the time Robert Space Industries' Astro Development Team, known as ADT, was studying options for a fourth production variant of the time-tested constellation. The development team, led by longtime RSI designer Jules Parley, began by taking a stock 2934 model year constellation Mark III chassis and outfitting it with a new interior supports. The final prototype seems unrecognizable when compared to what would ultimately become the first Phoenix, 
but this test was focused solely on under-the-deck modifications that would go on to support the eventual overhaul. The major challenge at this point wasn't so much the luxury styling as it was adapting and reworking the ship's design to support a wider variety of changes. Incorporating the hot tub, later made famous by the Variant's marketing campaign, required a major revision of the stock plumbing and waste disposal systems. The makeshift prototype was also outfitted with improved shields and privacy systems and the expectation that a luxury spacecraft would likely need such protections to stand out in its much more specific role. Building Partnerships With a prototype in hand, Robert Space Industries turned to another major challenge, how to redefine their workmanlike multi-crew vehicle as a luxury object that would appeal to those who would traditionally choose an origin design. Their solution was as much marketing as design. To make the Phoenix work, the ADT understood that they needed to partner with long-standing luxury brands instead of simply presenting their vision as the ultimate in high-class space travel. To that end, the company brought in a roster of household names known for producing the best of the best. These include designer Emil Quast, best known for his decadent design of Terra's Flohaus public assembly building, was brought in to design the Phoenix's luxury interior. ADT designers had initially constructed their own concept plan featuring plush leather furniture and extreme soft lighting. Quast threw out the existing designs, refusing to even look beyond the first page of the plan, and instead created the first iteration of the elegant cabin of the Phoenix, which is known for today. The Wintel Design Company, most familiar for offering high-end luxury craft goods, was given the task of equipping the master suite in the first version of the hot tub. Wintel spent 18 months researching the creation of what they called a complete sleep system to replace the standard Constellation fixtures aimed at adding every comfort possible to the typically utilitarian process of sleeping starside. Kruger Intergalactic was brought back to create an updated version of the P-52 Merlin bundled with standard model constellations. Their team developed the high-performance P-72 Archimedes to replace the Merlin, although tooling delays caused initial production phoenixes to ship with a Merlin instead. While the Merlin was purchased under license, RSI opted to buy exclusive rights to the Archimedes in order to prevent its use by other manufacturers. Atuvo, creators of the Food Sparse system, provided a licensed reworking of their signature Atuvo state table and kitchen system. Atuvo's engineers spent months refactoring their existing food technologies to fit into the small area allowed on the Phoenix due to a contractual obligation to make sure the resources available aboard the Phoenix were identical to those found in the finest kitchens. One partnership did not work out as intended. Luxury vehicle builder Krimner LTD was charged with developing a replacement for the RSI Ursa rover. Krimner LTD declared bankruptcy in the middle of the development process, forcing the team to scramble to find a replacement. RSI's own vehicle team ultimately developed the Lynx rover variant specifically for the Phoenix. To make the first production prototype possible, RSI gathered all the involved licensees, over 100 in total, at their development facility on Earth. Representatives from each company were incorporated into the ADT process for the remainder of the Phoenix's development cycle, allowing them visibility over not just their area of the ship's design, but to provide feedback on everything else being built. The prototype construction stage took roughly two years and concluded with space trials for a unique variant of the then-current Constellation Mark III. The Mark III Constellation had fewer hull changes for variants than the Mark IV, allowing more custom experimentation during the prototype phase. The Phoenix development team was also given unprecedented access to the work of a much larger Constellation Mark IV team, with the expectation that the variant would premiere as part of the launch plan for 2942. 
Delays relating to the Mark IV rework moved the launch to 2944, giving the Phoenix team an opportunity to soft launch the design. Starting in 2941, Robert Space Industries representatives were allowed to offer interested parties Mark III conversions that introduced the Phoenix concept. The Mark III's were upgraded to Phoenix status in the lab at Volatai using factory fresh base constellations. Only a handful of conversions were constructed, with most purchased by RSI's trusted partner corporations for executive operations. Production of the Phoenix variant of the Constellation Mark IV began in earnest in June 2944 alongside a media blitz intended to remind buyers of Robert Space Industries' prestigious history. The company produced advertisements featuring their original model Quantum Drive and sponsored multiple documentaries focusing on humankind's early interstellar expansion. All production model Phoenixes are constructed to base specifications alongside the other model constellations at RSI's Albany plant, and then ferried to a special facility at Luna for the installation of their interiors and other unique features. The first constellation Phoenix sold went to rock star Elroy Koss. The ship was commissioned by the then head of RSI outreach, Thar Obson, and personally delivered to Cass. Orders for corporate executive fleets and private citizens seeking a luxury experience came in quickly, selling out the first year's production allotment of Phoenixes in a matter of days. A single centennial constellation Phoenix has been constructed in honor of a 2946 production milestone for the entire constellation range. This unique Phoenix features a metallic gold livery and an interior exhaustingly detailed in 24 karat gold. This Phoenix was not offered for sale, and the only example remains owned by Robert Space Industries, who have occasionally used it for trade shows and other marketing pushes. In 2948, Robert Space Industries premiered a variant of a variant, the Constellation Phoenix Emerald, as competition with Origin's new model of 600 series spacecraft became more serious. The Emerald featured a lucky green paint scheme and a variant interior cabin design. Emeralds were produced in extremely limited numbers and have not become part of the normal production process. Market analysts believe that Robert Space Industries is happy with the positioning of the Phoenix despite increased competition from Origin and others. Less than 1% of Constellation fuselages become Phoenixes. And although the model generates between 5 and 7% of the total profits for the line depending on year, it is expected that the company will continue to produce Phoenixes for the foreseeable future. And there you have it, as it plays a commercial. Um, so one of the things, quickly, uh, if you're watching on YouTube or replay, um, I didn't share my screen. So you got the audio. <laughs> but you didn't get the video. Um, that video is available on our Beyond the Verse Star Citizen podcast YouTube channel. Um, you go into videos, go into extras, and you will find it there to watch. But if you are listening on podcast, I hope you enjoyed the voiceover and the music from Monument Studios. Love them to death. And with that, I hope this finds everybody well. Until next week when we get into episode 20, safe travels. You've been listening to Beyond the Verse, Star Citizen podcast with your host, Solus. Join our in-game organization, Soul Provision, by applying at www.robertspaceindustries.com forward slash orgs forward slash provision. You can get involved in the conversation with your questions, comments, or emotional outbursts by emailing us at starcitizenbtv at gmail.com. Watch us live on Thursdays, 8 p.m. Central, at youtube.com forward slash at starcitizenbtv. And follow the conversation over at Twitter and Instagram, both at forward slash starcitizenbtv. Once again, thank you for joining us. We hope this finds you well. Until next time, safe travels as you traverse beyond the verse.